Thank you, Carlos. I didn't have my headset on, so I have no idea what he said about me, but hopefully it wasn't bad. <laughs> so uh, I will start with Yo me amo América, and yo aprendo poco a poco. And besides knowing how to ask for Caprihenia, that is the only Spanish I know. <laughs> but um, thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, before I start, I do want to mention that I am here as an Aaron board member. However, this presentation is not affiliated at all with, with that particular um, role that I have. And it's purely a talk that I'm giving based on my over 20 years of experience in security. So there are so many issues surrounding security. Um, I very much enjoyed this last panel because I have been a proponent for IPv6 since the early 2000s. I started helping, building, uh, uh, helping people build IPv6 infrastructure since 2004. And back in those days, everybody was saying how security was built in, which was such a fallacy. Right? And I really like to get people to understand what security actually means. Not to be panicked about all of the hype that you see in the industry about yet another breach. Yes, the problems are real, the problems are really important, and we have to understand how do we collectively help with understanding the risks that we are facing and doing our part to help mitigate that. So I'm going to start with a little bit of a historical view because I started my networking career back in the late 1980s. A month into my first job was when the Robert Morris worm hit, right? And that is very much um, thought to be the first time that people realized that, wow, we can have things like internet worms. And so for the last 30 years, and I can't believe it's been 30 years, I've been watching the evolution of how the internet has grown, which is absolutely a great thing, but also how the criminal infrastructure has grown. So let's start. This very first slide just has a depiction. With a very technical audience, I usually show what a packet looks like, right? The header formats, the bits and bytes, because basically anything that can be modified in a protocol, how you send packets over the wire, um, can cause a security issue in these days, right? Usually denial of services because either a system doesn't know how to handle the, the information that it's getting or you're utilizing too much bandwidth because they're sending replies back and forth and so much bandwidth gets used for um, uh, malicious traffic. That's really nonsense. Um, <clears throat> so the area is extremely complex because we have so many devices, we have so many different protocols, and if you're somebody that is looking to do something malicious or create a criminal um, botnet, then you have a lot of tools available to you to investigate how you can misuse what's really meant to be you know, used for good in terms of connectivity and creating the overall internet. So you will never not have any attacks. Right? There will always be the possibility that somebody create something malicious or use the internet for malicious intent. Now, I often wonder why in the virtual world you have conversations where people think that they need to have absolute security when we know that in the physical world there is no such thing. Right? Everything that happens in the virtual world really mimics what's happening in the physical world. So the best we can do is look at where are the risks, what are they, and how can we best mitigate in our environments. Protocols will always have flaws. They're created by humans. I go to the Internet Engineering Task Force. I've seen some people in the last couple of days wear some IETF shirts. I was very happy about that because I think that geographic um, attendance and participation is extremely important. And this region certainly has a lot of very smart and capable people. But we're all human, so as we design protocols, they have some mistakes in them, flaws. Right? What happens? You discover a mistake, you fix it, you move on. The same thing happens with implementations. 
right? The people that are developing and coding to your devices, they're also humans. We are not perfect. So there will be some mistakes made. You catch the mistakes. Hopefully, you know, there'll be responsible disclosures around the vulnerabilities that somebody malicious may abuse, right? But you find the mistakes, you fix them, and you move on. From an operator perspective, it's kind of difficult because your main job is to make sure that data is flowing, right? You're providing connectivity from an end user to you know, the next step where it needs to get to. However, as an operator, I do view that you have responsibility to help in the overall goodness in the internet. So a lot of times this deals with filtering, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a couple of minutes. But it is really, really important to also look at what traffic is exiting um, your networks because there's so much malicious traffic out there in the internet that we really all do have to do our parts. And then I will touch upon Internet of Things because obviously that's a very big topic of today. And especially, you know, in the last couple of weeks, there's been much, much attention to something called WannaCry, which was an exploitation of a vulnerability. And what makes it really so onerous is the fact that now ransomware is involved and they're hitting hospitals, right? So it is becoming, in some ways, a life and death question. So if we look at a historical view, I, I, I can't always remember all the attacks and what they did, so I'm actually listing them here just so you have an idea. But the main point that I wanted to bring out, um, I, I started the security initiative at Cisco in the mid-90s. I spent from 1993 to 2000 working for the vendor Cisco. And what we started realizing in the mid-90s was that, you know, the internet can be used for harm. And, you know, certain attacks were starting to become um, real. And so back in 1999, uh, actually, no, 1996, 97 to 99, you had some uh, attacks that were huge news back in the day. Today, people would be like, oh, that's nothing. You know, but back in those times, this was huge news and made the headlines. So ping of death, right? Some of you might think, really, pings? Well, if you send 100,000 packets right, to a device, sometimes it couldn't handle it, it would just fall over, and all of a sudden you don't have that connectivity or you don't have the access. That is a big problem. Um, also in 97, there were things that we called um, TCP SYN attacks, right? And they still exist today, right? I mean, this is over 20 years later. Um, Smurf attack, where you basically broadcast a lot of ICMP packets. Um, Fraggle, which is very similar, but you used another protocol called ChargeN. Note that back in those days, um, I know specifically for Cisco since I worked there, but there were a lot of these protocols that were on by default. And for things like ChargeN, Right, it was decided that, you know, we probably should, nobody's really using them, so we should probably turn them off by default when you power a box up, so that if there were exceptions and people were using these protocols, they can then enable them. The problem with the Smurf attack was that all of a sudden ICMP became a bad word, right? And so some people panicked and they just disabled all of ICMP. But you use that for keep alives, right? The ping, ping request and reply packets to see whether or not a device is, is quote unquote alive, i.e. reachable. Now with IPv6, right, with some deployments, this has become a problem because people, if people are still thinking, hey, you know, in my configurations, I'm actually uh, stopping all of ICMP in, in the IPv4 world, they don't remember anymore why they did that. And with IPv6, you have to let certain ICMPv6 traffic through because it's a requirement for the protocol, right, to do neighbor discovery and router advertisements and things like that. So you have to understand how the protocols work. You also have to understand why some of these really old attacks right, made certain configurations, um, you know, reality in your environment, or even why devices have certain defaults. Now, 
my first book I wrote in 1999, and so when I first started looking at, you know, the history of attacks, I realized that I only listed denial of service attacks. I didn't even list distributed denial of service. You know why? They didn't exist. It wasn't until the year 2000 that you started to see distributed denial of service attacks. And so one of the first ones that was talked about was in 1999, which was called Trino. And so basically it you know, used master servers um, and it would control many what's known as demons. So it just distributed the attack surface. And there were specific ports used and it used UDP and ICMP traffic. Now, of course, attacks evolve also, and so I'm listing here some of the um, advancements that were made for this attack traffic. And you can see that they started learning that, you know, you, you shouldn't use specific ports because then people will block it, so then, you know, your, your malware won't work. And also they started using encrypted traffic. Right, so this is all, remember, this is all in 98, 99, 2000. 18 to 20 years ago. What we're seeing today is very similar. Right? And I, I always bring forth what we've known for 20 years already because I always wonder why are the attacks getting worse? Why are the impacts getting worse? Why is this a surprise for people? So I was at a conference last week, and I heard somebody on stage say that, oh, you know, the, the wanna cry. This is the first time that, you know, the world is waking up, you know, in terms of how serious security is. And I thought to myself, hmm, I don't think you've been around long enough. Because there's, I'm only listing some of these, but these are, um, these worms and viruses and botnets are basically the ones that I always think of as having been the game changers where people started to pay attention as to how bad the impact could be um, in, you know, in terms of the malicious traffic and, and um, the maliciousness out on the internet. And so Code Red, Slammer, Stuxnet, DNS Changer, Mirai, WannaCry, when I look at all of them, right, the thing that is really um, the trend that's been increasing from 2000 till today is that the scale is changing, right, by leaps and magnitudes. The sophistication is changing because attackers are getting much smarter at being under the radar and not getting detected, and also the impact. WannaCry scares me. Why it scares me is because it's ransomware. It's not like you can just build a new server on the, unless you have really, really good backups, but again, your backups may also have issues, right? Unless you've, you, you've made sure that there aren't any infections, there aren't the same vulnerabilities in your backups, or you have the mechanisms to patch your backups, because if you bring them up and they're unpatched, then you're gonna get hit again. Right? And with ransomware, you have to pay. I mean, it really scared me to hear about hospitals where you couldn't have operations, right? Uh, they couldn't give out medicine, they didn't have access to their database. So at this point in time, the sophistication and the overall impact has hit the highest that I have ever seen. So if we look at the continuing trends, the attackers will continue to try and change tactics. As I mentioned just a couple of minutes ago, right, an attacker doesn't want to be stopped. So they will keep uh, thinking of ways to change packet sizes, change time of day that they're sending data, um, utilize encryption more, because they want their infrastructure, their attack infrastructure, not to be taken down. The bandwidth for available malicious intent is going to continue to increase, right? As we heard just a couple of minutes ago, I mean, there's going to be submarine cables, even from Uruguay to a bunch of different countries. The, um, Netflix, I think the first day, was talking about, you know, how they're creating their own infrastructure. Many content infrastructures are 
rather than going necessarily through ISPs, they're creating their own fiber infrastructures. I know in my home, I have access to one gigabit of traffic, right, at a pretty reasonable cost. In some economies, that's possible. That means that if my home with my multitudes of devices is somehow hacked, then somebody can have one gigabit of extra bandwidth that's then aggregated somewhere else. Right? So we keep increasing the bandwidth available for good and for bad. And of course, the number of devices keep increasing. So if I look at what the new normal is for networks, I don't even understand what's going on anymore. I used to know networks, right? It was easy. Um, you had a router, you had a switch, and you had devices, right? You connected through the internet and something else on the other side. That was 25 years ago, maybe 30 years ago. Um, and then, you know, slowly but slowly, we started having proxy devices and, you know, God knows what else. And right now, our, our networks are pretty darn complex. I mean, how many of you look at what traffic is going out of your network, right? Even home networks. Um, obviously, many users don't need to do that, right? Especially home users. But I look at my home as a very small business because I used to have a consulting company. And so I have about five routers, I don't know, seven or eight servers. Yes, it's not the normal home. But when I look at small businesses, right, or larger businesses, do you actually understand what traffic is going where and why? And I will argue that most likely not. So this is part of the problem in that there's so many new devices, there's so many applications, right? We're, we're, we're utilizing the internet for so many good things that are helping us in our overall lives but that comes at a cost of really not necessarily understanding what is happening on the wire and who's trying to um, do something abusive. So I do test a lot of things at home, and I don't know, about five years ago, I spent money to get one of the first LIFX light bulbs because I just wanted to play with them. I mean, how cool is it to have your iPhone and you know make the light go brighter or dimmer or now change it to blue or red. Do I really have time for that? No. Is it cool? Yes. Right. Um, television. I, I do. I very much like IPv6. I'm a proponent. Eight months ago, I bought a new television. You know what my criteria was? Does it do IPv6? There were two models, and I picked one because my criteria was I wanted to do IPv6. Did I need it? No. Did I want it? Yes. And then when the television was installed and the installer said, okay, what's your Wi-Fi password? I said, okay, I'll take it from here. And I started looking at the TV and I realized, ah, it's an Android device. Not that it's bad that it's an Android device, but then I thought, wow, I really have to look at what the default settings are. And I, as I started looking at the default settings, I started wondering, why is this on by default? Why is something on by default send this information to that place? I don't know what that place is, right? And I really started realizing that as I'm trying to use my smartphone, right, to control things that I find are cool and interesting in my home, and many people are doing that with the temperature controls and whatever else, right, what else is my phone communicating with? Right? And the thing that scares me the most, why am I talking about my home? Because in your work environments, tell me that you use two different phones. In many places, they don't. Right? You have the one phone that you use for work um, situations, and you also use it in your home environment, and who knows what all the applications are on there. Where do you actually do backups? Right? What is on your phone, right? Do you have corporate email on your phone when you're doing backups? Are you eliminating, you know, email in the backups that are in the cloud or not? I would argue probably not because you want what's quick and easy. You just want your backups done. So things are getting so complex, but we have to understand where our data is going. So 
people keep talking about everything is new, you know, things are so rapidly changing, and I will absolutely argue, and I will happily do it over Caprihenia's this evening with anybody that wants to, that there are so many things that stay the same that we have to pay attention to. Because saying that security is complex is not an excuse to say, I'm sorry, it's too difficult, and I just don't know where to start. So many of the distributed denial of service attacks use the same mechanisms that have been used for the last 20 years. Credential compromise, it is a huge part of how compromises occur. And I will just state that there was a lot of uh, information in the news, I mean, I couldn't read all the Spanish news, obviously, but, you know, about banks that were hacked here in Brazil, you know, just some weeks or months ago. And there was a lot of misinformation, but what I learned is it really started with a credential hack, right? You have to know where you're, um, where you're vulnerable, right, just with using passwords, not doing multi-factor, usually two-factor authentication. Knowing your credentials, where they're used and how, is extremely, extremely important. Is it difficult? No. Is it boring? Yes. Okay? I mean, the really cool and fun things like encryption, they're fun. I think encryption is fun. But really, most of the things that are causing the vulnerabilities and the breaches today are just simple things that people aren't paying enough attention to. Implementation flaws, right? You're looking at all the imp uh, impact of WannaCry, right? People didn't patch. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, the minute that you have a patch, you need to upgrade. If you don't, you know, you're, you're, you're not being intelligent, because that is not accurate. They're in large companies, you have to do impact assessment, right? You have to create a plan for patching because you don't want a patch to cause other issues. That is all fine, but you have to understand what the potential impact in your environment is if you do not patch, and also make sure you have mechanisms in place to make sure that the risk of exploitation is very low in your environment. It's the risk that you take business risk tolerance. And security continues to be an exercise of blind trust. I have seen this for the last 20 years that everybody blames each other, right? I mean, technical standards, oh, the standards are so bad, you know, it's, it's they already had flaws. Yep, let's fix them. Vendor implementation, oh, look, they have bugs. Yes, I'm sorry, you're human, somebody's writing the code, they're not gonna be perfect, but let's assess, right, and let's help each other get better at this. And then operational employments, right, not punting, and that's, I'm not sure if the translators will translate punting, um, but making sure that you don't blame others where there's things that you can do in an operational environment to also help mitigate security risks. So I'm showing this slide because a couple of years ago in 2014, there was a really good presentation done at a security conference in San Diego um, that talked about amplification hell. And it really talked about how many of the protocols that we have today can be exploited to create distributed denial of service attacks. And I know that in this region, and many others also, Right? There are criminal activities going on where you, basically it's an extortion. You know, if, if you don't do this, then we're going to create a denial of service attack. Well, how are the denial of service attacks realized? Right? Are there things in your environment, devices in your environment, that are, make it easier to create a denial of service attack? Right? You really need to pay attention to them. So I always say, go back to the basics, right? Because I think we overall are making security much more complex than it needs to be. Security is a process and it's detailed to attention. But at the very basics, right, what you're trying to do is control access um, to data and to specific areas of the network. 
You want to make sure that the network is available, right? Services and, and data. Um, to me, integrity of the data has always been much more important than confidentiality, but, you know, some people um, could argue the different way, but for me, knowing that when I'm communicating to you, that you're you're pretty well assured that the information came from me and nobody changed it in transit, I will argue that that is much more important than keep it in confidential. And then obviously we also want to prote uh, protect against uh, any kind of intrusion and breaches. So again, looking at the fundamentals of what you're trying to achieve, right? you want to make sure that you have user and device authentication and authorization. Authentication means that you know the identity of the entity um, trying to access the user or the device, maybe even application, and that they're authorized to do so. With access control, it gets interesting because people are notoriously awful at filtering in, in, in deployments. And, and I understand this. I used to help people with filters. And filtering is difficult. You know, it looks easy at first. But then when you think about all your backup links and everything that has to work when something goes wrong, right? I mean, filtering really is an engineering project. You have to understand what data should be going where. And you can argue that, well, I don't really want to filter. I shouldn't filter because, you know, I'm just a pipe and data should just flow through me. I can't necessarily argue against that, but if you're part of the problem, then if other traffic is hitting you and you're later gonna ask an upstream to help filter, why should they do it to help you? Right, so we do. Uh, Christine had a, a comment in the very first day saying, how do we build communities to help each other? And she's absolutely right, because as a community, we do have to help each other. So in terms of practicing good hygiene, these are the fundamentals. You should have enough bandwidth to absorb denial of service attacks. In many environments, this is not something that can be done, either because economies or you just don't have the infrastructure in place. Well, if you can't do that, then you want to filter unwanted traffic, right, or rate limit. I mean, there are mechanisms that you can use to help um, mitigate against some denial of service attacks. Maybe not everything, right, but at least to do something. Have effective alerting and logging mechanisms. Um, way back in the late 80s, somebody gave me a book called The Cuckoo's Egg, and I was so interested in it, I went to sleep at four in the morning after I read the whole thing. And what still fascinates me is that guy's Cliff stole, and I don't have an accurate memory, it was either a two cent or a 25 cent accounting error that he was looking at data, he's like, why is that? Right? Most of us would be like, eh, that's in the noise, who cares? Right? But actually looking at why that discrepancy happened, I mean, imagine two cents, 25 cents, and whatever it translates into your currency, right? I mean, a very, very low amount, it led to him actually exposing and finding one of the largest uh, uh, criminal um, you know, cyber rings at that time. So we can't just dismiss when we see some anomaly, we actually have to log for anomalies or you know, NetFlow and whatever information that will give us a baseline of what our traffic looks like. And then if we see something that looks a little bit odd, we need to spend the time to investigate it. Because in many situations that I've seen, criminals will first test something, and then when they see that, oh yeah, nobody's doing anything, at some point later the attack will happen. Right, so it might just be a reconnaissance event. Creating and maintaining redundancy of infrastructure. Right, to me it's architecture 101. Right, how you actually build resilient networks. When we look at the Mirai botnet, um, it was almost humorous to me how much the media had talked about how uh, uh, some environments were really silly because they didn't have backups for certain you know, DNS infrastructures. 
But I know some of the people that were being made fun of, and it's interesting because they did have plans in place, it's just that their backup, they had coding work to do because if you use the provider like Dyn, I'll just say it, they had features and functionality that some others didn't. So in-house, you had to do actually a project and had code to write to use an effective secondary, right? But again, it's a risk that you take. One environment, they were gonna work on it the next quarter. Well, I mean, that timeline got you know expedited. But if you didn't even have plans in place, right, that's a problem, right? Especially if you have critical services that would go down. And credential management is something that um, I really want to emphasize here. So credential compromise is an enabler to many, 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 many attacks. And how do uh, malicious people get access to credentials? There's a variety of ways. You know, phishing campaigns are extremely popular, right? I mean, somebody sends you a spam, an email it looks like a good link. And they're getting smarter. You know, I get hundreds of emails a day and times that I'm like really tired or in a hurry. And I get emails from airlines these days or, or other companies that I do work with or where I shop, right? And it looks legitimate. And then I have to spend a minute saying, wait, I didn't buy anything from there, right? And I didn't do this. And then I'm knowledgeable enough that I will actually go and see what domain that email address is associated with. The normal user won't do that, right? And in your environments, in your work environments, if you don't educate absolutely everybody in your company that unfortunately today you do have to do some of this, you know, they're gonna get fished. And so most of these phishing scams are such that you get directed to a um, spoofed site so that they can get your username and password. You know, laptops get stolen. Um, I can't even begin to tell you how many people use the same credentials for multiple sites, right? Have you ever looked at how many credentials or how many sites you log into? I have 180 sites. Okay, there's numerous for work environments, but my personal environment, places I go shopping, every single place that I want to look and maybe look at something online, they require me to enter a username and password. I hate that. You know, I may not even buy anything online, but I certainly want to look at stuff, right? Then there's all your banking, and there's all the conferences, and I don't even know what else, right? But we do everything online. Imagine 180 accounts. Right? And when I talk to some of my friends who work for different companies, right, and they may you know, be in business environments, they're not techies. Right? When they say, oh yeah, I use that same password when I log into Facebook because you know, otherwise I wouldn't remember it. And I'm like, don't do that. Or don't tell me if you do that, but don't do that. Right? And people do that more than you would think. And then I'm like, well, if you do two-factor authentication, or some kind of multi-factor, I won't be that mad at you because it makes it that much harder for somebody to do a credential compromise. Okay? But you need to think about how these credentials are utilized and how they can be compromised. So I had created this slide um, a while back. Um, I'm also on the Security Advisory Council for ICAM, and we had done a, a paper um, that dealt with best practices for credential management. And we came up with all the ways that people use and abuse credentials, right? And so basically when you're creating, changing, or revoking, or renewing credentials, right, your passwords, your keys, your public-private keys, then you need to look at how do you distribute them, how you store them, how you recover them, how you delegate or transfer them, revoking, destroying. These are all process issues. And I usually think of it as a pilot's checklist. A lot of my friends, for whatever reason, um, you know, in the tech industry, have decided that once they had some money, they wanted to learn how to fly, right? And so there are some of my friends that I will never get in an airplane with because they're the ones that are like, oh, yeah, I checked the fuel yesterday. And I'm like, all of a sudden, I have to get a haircut or something, right? Because 
they have to check every single thing. I mean, who knows if you had a leak and all of a sudden, you know, some fuel leaked out and you only have half the tank left, right? And I view security as the same kind of thing. It's extremely detail-oriented. And when it comes to credential management, it is extremely detail-oriented. You have to understand what you're doing. Um, three, four years ago, um, when we had heart bleed, um, I was working in some environments and I heard of a story where um, the people that were sending out customer notifications were trying to be really helpful and they would send out, they wanted to send out the new passwords in clear text email. Right? Now, I don't laugh at things like that because I'm in it to educate people. Not everybody's had 20 years of security experience, even five years or maybe even one year. Right? They're trying to do their jobs, they're trying to be helpful, and so we have to continuously educate each other. But credential management really is huge, and it's huge in everybody's environment to understand. So know all the credentials that are utilized, you know, your certificates. Later this afternoon, you're gonna hear about the DNSSEC root key rollover. Right? October 11th, very, very, very important day. Right? And we have to pay attention because whenever you're doing credential renewals, right, there's things that could fall through the cracks. So we have to pay attention to the details. Vulnerabilities. Um, I was a chief security officer three years ago at a company. And I have to tell you that it's extremely difficult to keep up with all the vulnerabilities with all the devices and operating systems that may be in your environment. But you have to try as best you can. Um, and again, win cry, right? A very, very good example. And so put yourself on mailing lists for the vendors, get updated somehow on, you know, you have to understand all of the operating systems, all the systems that are using in your environment and somehow get notifications when there's a vulnerability that's disclosed. Um, I am a huge believer of certs, national certs and you know, all the other ones, because watching what's happened in the last 20 years with sharing information and sharing with trusted groups has been really important in helping and mitigate so many attacks and so much information. Because the earlier that you know of certain issues and situations, the better you can protect yourself, right? And I do understand that many national certs, it's a matter of how much do you trust them. I have worked with many here in the Latin American region, and I can tell you that from a technical level, they are some of the most astutest that I have ever come across. You know, and I would just encourage you to create relationships and talk to each other because the sharing of information to help stop some of this activity and understanding what vulnerabilities exist is really, really important. I'm just gonna to touch briefly on DNS because I don't have enough time. But I used to do security assessments. Um, I left Cisco in 2000, I had a company for 15 years where I just went around the world and help people with security issues, right? Understand it, uh, give advice to vendors on what they should do, and then for other companies did security assessments. And I will admit that for the first five to seven years, I didn't include DNS, because it wasn't something I really ever thought about. And then I'd say about 10 years ago, right, I started looking at what's going on and how much the DNS was being utilized for criminal activity. And so we have to pay attention as to what domains are getting utilized or created, right? Are they being created for harm? Are they being created, um, you know, for good, but somebody is, is using them for harm? But really understand what is happening to your DNS. And I had a slide earlier that talked about game changers. DNS changer was one of those. And what DNS changer was, if you look at this slide, it kind of shows what supposedly happens, right? Where an ISP will, um, you know, give the corporate uh, environment a, an IP address that's basically the, here's, uh, you know, your DNS recursive resolver address. 
But many people change that, you know, or companies say, you know, we have our own, or, you know, they go to 8888, which is Google. There's other companies also that are creating managed open recursive resolvers. But the key point I want to make here is understand what is going on with your DNS. Because DNS is very often utilized as a mechanism for malicious and criminal activity. So you'll see these in the slides that I have. Understand who your registrars are, um, what they do, how they uh, validate identity so that they don't um, do any domain hijacking and understand all the domains that you use and monitor for any kind of abuse. So sharing, we need to get better. I mentioned that already. Criminals have no barriers to sharing. They share everything, infrastructure, um, credit card information, right? Sometimes they just sell it. I mean, there's a whole underground economy. I cannot emphasize enough that we have to get better at sharing information with each other. Um, if nothing else, share things that have no impact to personal information. If you're sharing uh, information on here's, here's uh, you know, who's doing any kind of SSH brute force attacks or amplification attacks, that really shouldn't impact any kind of re uh, regulation issues. And I'm speeding up a little bit because I'm out of time, so I'm sorry about that. But global efforts for action, there's a lot of groups. Get to know these groups in your environment. Again, there are, there are trusted communities where you share information for specific items, either ISPs or different industries. Um, I don't have time to talk about this one. The only last point I want to make is don't believe everything you read. So for some reason, security is so overhyped that when I know about certain things that are going on and why the attacks happened and how they happened, when I read about them in the news, I'm like, huh? Where did they get that information? And so users who are not in, in some trusted communities where they don't know what really happened, they have all this information that is inaccurate. And these inaccuracies cause more issues than, than you would imagine. So being part of the solution, I hope your takeaway is that please, let's all do our part. I would like to see certification for minimal security requirements for any Internet of Things um, devices. And at a minimum, I always say that what I want to see is no user, default username and password, use cryptographically protected protocols to access the device, and have mechanism for software firmware upgrade. And that's really it and all I have time for, so thank you. I don't know if I have time for questions. Si, si hay alguna pregunta, unos minutitos, uno o dos minutos. Um, I'm going to throw it in, in, in Spanish for everyone. Quisiera conocer tus opiniones, Merique, respecto de la implementación de eh, validación de las direcciones de origen, source address validation, y toda la situación acerca de los resolutores abiertos. Si pudieras compartir tu, tu parecer al respecto, por favor. Absolutely, and if I understood your question correctly, it was what do I think about uh, source or address validation? And yeah, if you can share your thoughts and your suggestions to this community with yes. regards to source address validation and open resolvers. So uh, there is still a lot of denial of service attacks that utilize spoof traffic. And anti-spoofing mechanisms are extremely important. And this is where I was talking earlier about filtering. So um, I would really encourage people to look at anti-spoofing techniques, anti-spoof filtering, and especially at egress points of your network, so that when you're sending traffic out to the rest of the internet, that you're sending legitimate traffic out and not traffic that is potentially um, being spoofed. And for any of you that um, want more information, I, I took out a slide that I specifically had on anti-spoofing because I thought the presentation was getting too long. 
But there is some excellent work being done um, by CADA, C-A-I-D-A, and if you Google for spoofer project, S-P-O-O-F-E-R project, you will find some updates, and there's some really good information in there where you can actually look in your environment to see whether or not spoofing is, is something that you're allowing, and if so, then hopefully you will look at how you mitigate that. Hello. Uh, I'm going to speak in English. Thank you. Oh. My name is Alex. I'm from Mexico. I just want to ask you about the idea now that we're having IPv6, uh, so to say, we have now a public IP on every device. Uh, what's your opinion about, about that on a security matter? I mean, uh, I have some talks about it, about the idea now that we have the ransomware everywhere. I don't know, maybe we, we, we will be needing antivirus for, for a smart TV or a smart, uh, smart uh, for fridge or something. I just want to ask your opinion about it. Let, I'm, I'm not sure I caught the first part. Were you asking about IPv6 specifically? Yeah, the idea of having a public IP on every device with IPv6, what's your opinion about it on a security matter? I, I definitely have an opinion on this. So um, I am not a believer of hiding addresses. And the reason why is because to me it's uh, security through obscurity and people get lazy about actually understanding and creating effective filters. And so I've had discussions with many people about whether or not you have ULAs, right, which are the private addresses. I do not like them. I mean, this is a personal choice, personal preference, because I think that if you're architecting to the best security environment, you should be very cognizant of what traffic you allow uh, through different entry points uh, in your networks. And so I think that hiding the addresses sometimes causes more harm, and then protocols have to be changed, and it just causes much more confusion than actually trying to figure out how do you not hide and how do you mitigate the risk.